the European Union has agreed not to stand in the way of nuclear energy production. Some member states are considering expanding their nuclear industries. What does the future of Europe hold for nuclear energy? So important was nuclear energy in the eyes of European countries that the Treaty of Rome, which founded what would turn into the European Union, created Euratom to oversee nuclear power in Europe. When the first nuclear reactor started being built in the 1960s and 70s, they held the promise of clean energy. People were enthusiastic, seeing it as the hallmark of modernity, contrasting with the dirtiness of coal. The oil shocks of the 1970s, which saw the price of petrol quadruple overnight and oil shortages in the West, convinced governments to invest massively in nuclear technology. The number of nuclear reactors increased rapidly, particularly in France and Japan, which had been extremely dependent on oil up until then. Yet in most of the world, the honeymoon didn't last for long. People started learning about radioactivity, nuclear waste started building up, and reactors weren't as safe from accidents as they were promised to be. This built up local resistance to many nuclear projects, such that the deployment of nuclear reactors stalled. A series of disasters, particularly Three Mile Island in 1979 in the United States and Chernobyl in the Soviet Union in 1984, which saw a cloud of radioactive material cover large chunks of Europe, gave the public validation of the dangers of nuclear energy. Public opinion took a turn for the worst, and nuclear programs were suspended. You can clearly see this in the age of the world's nuclear reactors, which are mostly more than 35 years old because they stopped being built after Chernobyl. While in the West, the accident was pinned on Eastern communist technology in opposition to safe Western technology, it put a dent in nuclear programs. There seemed to be a rebirth for nuclear energy in the 2000s. Germany showed interest in extending the operational life of its reactors, and France went around promoting its nuclear technology, even going as far as suggesting building nuclear reactors in Muammar Gaddafi's Libya to drive sales for its large nuclear industry. Part of this renewed drive was the growing awareness around the world that global warming was a large threat that needed to be addressed through decarbonization. Renewable energy was still in its infancy, and the only credible low-carbon energy source was nuclear, and it seemed that nuclear energy might get a fresh start as the solution to global warming. An explosion was heard and smoke seen at the power plant this morning, and uh, here it is. Wow. And as we watch that, Malcolm Grimston, what are your thoughts? That's, I mean, that, that, still speculating. One possibility of that is a hydrogen oxygen explosion. That's quite an energetic one. As a result of Fukushima, nuclear suffered a second rollback. Planned power plants didn't materialize, and some countries, such as Germany, even planned their exit from nuclear energy in the aftermath of the disaster. This has actually led to an increase in emissions as it turned coal power plants back on to make up for the shortfall of energy. France, the main nuclear country in Europe, hesitated, announcing billions of investment in 2011, then calling for a cut in 2014 under a different president, before staying with the status quo due to high exit costs. This has led to uncertainty around the future of nuclear power in Europe, which currently produces 24% of the EU's electricity. Yet as the green transition gets underway, old debates about nuclear energy's role in tackling climate change have re-emerged. One of the main reasons for this is due to how decarbonizing an economy would work and the amount of energy, particularly electricity, that's needed to do so. Fossil fuels, it turns out, are bad for the climate and should be eliminated. Yet that poses a problem. You see, switching electricity production to renewable energy is possible, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. Electricity represents only 21% of the EU's total energy consumption. Natural gas? used not only to produce electricity, but also used in industry and to produce heat, made up 24.4% of the EU's energy consumption in 2017. It serves as a building block for the chemical industry and is used to produce essential goods such as fertilizer. These can indirectly be produced with electricity by first producing hydrogen, which we covered in another video. Petroleum made up 30% of the EU's energy demand in 2017 and is mostly used in the mobility sector. As part of the green transition, the EU is currently expected to see 23% of its cars turn electric by 2030, which means that a sizable amount of the energy that used to be pumped into cars now needs to be produced in the form of electricity. Currently, electricity isn't being used to power cars, nor is it being used to produce fertilizers. In other words, decarbonizing means increasing electricity production to be able to cover the non-electric needs that are currently being satisfied with fossil fuels. For example, the cities of Drenthe and Groningen in the Netherlands, which plan to be champions of green energy and greener hydrogen by 2030, would see Dutch energy consumption increase by 35%.
Safe to say, Europe will need a lot of energy to get itself off of fossil fuels. Leading all to the question, where will the energy for the green transition come from? The European Commission's answer is renewable energy, which is set to make up 30% of energy production and 54% of electricity production by 2030. Renewable energy is more than three times cheaper than nuclear energy, and costs are falling rapidly. Yet some disagree. The reality is that Europe is energy poor as a continent. The continent is far north, meaning that solar energy is only moderately beneficial on most of the continent, and wind energy is unevenly spread. Eastern Europe is particularly energy poor, having nearly no coastlines for offshore wind and not particularly sunny conditions. Nuclear energy also offers something renewables don't, stability. It offers an energy supply that doesn't fluctuate with the weather. The Polish Minister of Energy has said that nuclear energy was needed because renewable sources that Poland plans to develop, including offshore wind farms and solar power, needed a backup of stable supplies. This is true for most of Eastern Europe, which has lobbied hard to include nuclear energy in the EU's definition of low-carbon energy, despite having few nuclear reactors themselves. The Czech Republic has said it has no other choice than nuclear energy in order to meet the EU climate goals. Poland, which produces most of its energy with coal, is also likely to buy $18 billion in nuclear technology from the United States. Even the Netherlands, which previously had rejected expanding its nuclear industry, is now considering it once again after lagging behind on its renewable energy commitments for most of the past decade. Together these countries, which include the Czech Republic, Finland, France, Hungary, the Netherlands, Poland and Romania, which were opposed by Austria, Denmark, Ireland, Latvia, Luxembourg, Portugal and Spain, have successfully lobbied to include hydrogen produced with nuclear energy as green hydrogen, bringing Europe closer to a partially nuclear future. These nuclear ambitions, however, may be fraught with difficulty. As the European Commissioner for the European Green Deal, Franz Timmermans, put it, the disadvantage I need to mention is that it's very expensive. It's very, very expensive. And if you invest in it, you're stuck with it for a very, very long period of time. He added, citing the need to take into account the whole life cycle of the investment, from building costs to waste treatment. Indeed, costs have skyrocketed. The EPRs, the European Pressurized Reactors, designed by France to be the latest generation of nuclear reactors for Europe, are all more than 10 years late and more than 10 billion euros over budget due to stricter regulation and the lack of scale for the nuclear industry that could have helped spread costs over multiple reactors. Without the backing of the French government, the project would have failed long ago. Standards & Poor, a rating agency, has said that nuclear energy cannot exist without extensive state support, something that is true both in Russia and China, where nuclear energy continues to grow and has historically been true in France, which has the highest share of nuclear energy in the world. This is because of the necessity to cover end-of-life costs and accident risks that ultimately fall on countries as a whole, not the companies that develop nuclear reactors. The need for state aid poses some problems. The liberalization of the EU markets means that there are strict rules against the very state aid that is crucial to the success of building a nuclear reactor. While the European Commission will not block state aid for new nuclear projects in Poland and the Czech Republic, it will also not support them, which means large costs will fall onto the countries that seek to develop nuclear energy. Because of the division at the European level, the EU's acceptance of nuclear energy in its member states is in no way an endorsement. And because of this, there will be no EU-wide support for the technology, and individual countries' efforts to build up nuclear energy may not be enough on their own. To conclude, the European Union is energy poor and needs to electrify its energy production to cut back on carbon. While renewable energy sources are the privileged pathway in many European countries, other countries realize that meeting their emission targets with renewable energy alone will be a difficult task. They have started to explore nuclear energy as an option, which may lead to the technology becoming resurgent in parts of the continent. Yet at the same time, high costs and the EU's unwillingness to support the industry continent-wide due to opposition from some member states means individual countries will have to bear the costs alone. This was Into Europe. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like, comment and subscribe for the latest updates and analysis on European news.